So welcome to another episode of the Oh Hell No podcast. Today I have Dr. Timothy Yen. Um, he is a clinical psychologist and an author. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Welcome to the Oh Hell No podcast. Let's do this. I'm really excited to be talking with you, Keisha. Yeah, I'm excited too, because you... <laughs> my production is like <laughs> like my lighting and everything sorry um oh, good <laughs> yeah so um yeah I'm excited too because I love talking about decision making and um this is so interesting to me so the first uh question I want to start with is um what made you decide to go into clinical psychology you want, you only want honest answers, right? So yes, absolutely. The honest answer is I thought it was a sham job when it first presented itself. I thought, Hey, if you're going to pay me to like, listen to people talk about their problems. I'm like, done. I do that for free with my friends. So you're going to pay me to do it. It sounds good. But then when I, when I joined the military and I did psychology kind of work in the military, I realized you know, there's a lot more to it and, and it does help people. It really does change lives. And so that's when I decided I had to go back to school, make sure I got trained up so I can help more people. Wow. So, um, when you went into the military, were you a full blown, um, psychologist or were you still studying and like, what was that like? Straight out of high school. Didn't know nothing. Didn't really know anything about psychology. I wanted to go in as a journalist. But then I found out I was severely colorblind when I was going through my examination. So mental health was one of the only few jobs left that I could pick. So it was kind of like this fate thing that kind of funneled me to this career path. Wow, that's so interesting. So what do you love the most about the field? Well, I, I tell a lot of people this, when it comes to picking a career, there are two check boxes that are really important to me. Check box number one, it has to be interesting and engaging. People are very interesting, very engaging. Uh, it's uh, You feel like you're playing Sherlock Holmes like every time because there's like a puzzle. There's something to figure out and get to the bottom of. So that piece I love. And then the second piece of the equation is doing meaningful work. I want to know that the time that I spend that an invest in really does make a difference and improves people's lives. So psychology, being a psychologist really fit those two categories. And I love hearing stories. I love being able to co-labor, partner with people to create better lives. Nice. So when I ask questions, I, I always take notes. So if you see me writing, I'm not like, you know, ignoring you. <laughs> I just want to make sure you know. You do you. Yeah, that's, that's cool. <laughs> so what do you struggle with in this field? Like there's always something at work, no matter how much we love work that just drives us insane or that we hate. So what is that for you? Documentation. Mm. Not, not a big fan of having to write down the session. It's magical when it happens. And then there's the paperwork, the part that's not so sexy, but what it's you, important. I get it. Yeah. So it has to be done. Yeah. How do you feel about this whole digital age? Like where now when you go to the doctors, everything is like typed into the computer. Is that the same thing for you too with your patients? Yes. In that it's important to have a paper trail in terms of what is being talked about in summary, and it helps both myself and whoever I'm working with kind of keep tabs on the change and what we're focused on. So there's, there's definitely a method to the madness. It, it's important to do, but the process of summarizing an hour session into five sentences, it takes quite a bit of processing power to, to really capture the essence of it. And it takes time to, to type some of these things up. Yeah, absolutely. I could just imagine. So you have this book called Choose Better, the Optimal Decision Making Framework, right? Okay. So what prompted you to write this book? So originally, it, the idea came from a dinner that I had with a friend who happens to be a CEO of this tech company. And I was asking her the question, as a executive coach, as a psychologist, what is something that I can do to bring value to your company? And she told me 
critical thinking. So how do you help my employees, my supervisors, my executives think better? And what she meant by that was in a very fast paced industry, there are a lot of experts, a lot of chefs in the kitchen. A lot of people have their idea of what should go down and they're supposed to work together. So it's really hard for them to be on the same page. So she was asking me, is there a way that you can help people streamline their thoughts, help them make better decisions in a short amount of time so that our company can move forward and make progress? So I took that, that idea and thought about it a little bit more. And I realized this is what I do with my clients every day. Everyone that sits in my office is someone who is dissatisfied with their life on, on one level or another, and their decisions have gotten them where they're at now. So the work that I do is largely around you know, identity work for sure, but also how to think through and identify issues, how to work through them, how to make the most powerful, authentic choice from the decisions that you have options to choose from, I suppose. And I realized it's not a tech industry issue, right? It's like a human thing. So I took some of my expertise and my experience and compiled it to a book. Wow. So why do you think people have so much trouble with decision making? Like I interviewed someone um, and they told me that there was actually a decision making class. And I didn't even know that you could take a class on decision making, right? So there's like a science to it. But why do you think that, you know, we have so much trouble with it? Well, I don't know if we have two or three hours of talk, <laughs> but there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of reasons why decision making is challenging for a lot of people. And to be real, even though I wrote the book, I still have trouble making decisions. It's not like I'm exempt from this stuff. And, and I'll tell you some of the, the key reasons why people have difficulties making decisions. One is we live in a, an era where we have so much access to knowledge. Like we have just so many, uh, so much information at our fingertips, literally. And because we're exposed to so much knowledge, we, are exposed to a lot of options. And sometimes it, we just kind of the analysis paralysis, like we end up getting paralyzed because we don't want to make the wrong choice. And because of that, we end up procrastinating, delaying it, not choosing. So, so that's a piece of it is not wanting to be wrong about our choice. And when you have that many options, I mean, they can't all be the best choice. So that can kind of mess people up. Uh, for some other people, it could be some of their past experiences, uh, upbringings, and certain kind of beliefs that they have inherited or, or cultivated in their mind, either that they're not good enough, they're not worthy about certain things, or that's impossible. And sometimes, or many times, the barrier to making the best choice for an individual's life is themselves. They get in their own way because of their past experiences or whatever belief system that is not working for them. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, but there's so many different reasons as to why people don't make great decisions. Right. So everyone talks about living an authentic life, right? That's like the big buzz phrase of, I don't know, the century, <laughs> <laughs> but for some, um, the road is not easy, right? So what are some steps that we can take to find um, ourselves, um, you know, on the path to living a more authentic life? Because it doesn't just happen overnight, right? Um, you have to, um, some people need to get therapy and um, unlearn certain behaviors or certain thought processes and things like that before they can even get on the path to living their authentic life, right? <laughs> so what Correct. would you say are some tips, um, baby steps that people can take to get in um, formation <laughs> to, you know, start moving towards that authentic life? Awesome. So I would probably suggest going through the first two pillars of the framework, 
which what my bo my book outlines uh, a very uh, what I believe is a streamlined series of questions to help people really get to the heart of what is a optimal decision. So to answer your question, I would probably say it's the first two pillars of the four, right? Uh, pillar number one would be being in tune with your emotions and understanding what your feelings are trying to tell you. And authenticity begins with being real with yourself, not what society believes you should be thinking or feeling, but the fact that you have a strong feeling towards anything, that's already a, it's already pointing to the fact that you care about something. The, the question is what? And feelings will help you uncover what those things are. And pillar number two would be your value system, meaning what is meaningful, what matters most to you. And that's kind of like your North Star, that that's when your life style, your behaviors, uh, the way you treat yourself, the way you treat others, when you're aligned with the things that are most important to you, that is my definition of authenticity. For example, if you have a, a strong value for generosity, but then you're super frugal and you never spend money on anyone and you're always just you know, hoarding stuff, then there's going to be a inauthentic experience. For that individual because they care about wanting to be generous but their actions are clearly not aligned with that so of course yes counseling there's other ways family friends sometimes can help you see what is the barrier that's keeping you from living out those values but of course the first step is to figure out what those values are and that's its own kind of process but i would say those two things right being in touch with what your feelings are telling you and identifying what those values are for yourself. So this is a part of your framework. Would you say that this is the foundation for your overall framework or there's something a little bit deeper before you get to you you know your your framework? So it is part of the overall framework for decision making. So that's the first two steps of the framework. Okay. So in this, you talked a little bit about um, doing things for others or, you know, like wanting to like kind of, no, I don't want to say please others, but have great experiences with others and knowing what you, um, what, what you value, what you love before you can ugh, <laughs> have these experiences with others. So can you explain to us what's a good way to, I don't know, fine tune that? Like if you are married, let's say, and um, maybe your partner likes to do something and maybe you don't really value it much, what would you say you should do? Should you like just try to please them and go along with it? Or should there be a compromise? Is that being authentic to yourself? Is that not? Like, what would you say about that? All right, let's roll with that example. So it actually reminds me of something a psychologist once said. I, I went to this seminar, I think his name is Terry Hargraves, and he, he was talking about couples in particular, and he just gave this really funny analogy. So he said, I don't like the ballet. My wife loves the ballet. We like the ballet. And at first when I heard that, I was like, man, that brother is whipped. Right? Like, like he just, his identity just got wiped out because he's pretty much just going to do whatever his wife does. But then Terry went on to explain that it's true. The husband would not go to the ballet on his own. His wife likes the ballet, but when they go together, there's aspects of the ballet that he does like. He, he does like getting dressed up. He likes going to the dinners. He likes the fact that his wife is happy, even though he doesn't understand a thing about the ballet, but, but he'll go because there's elements of the ballet that he's grown to like. And when it, when it comes to incorporating others, part of a meaningful life for probably most people is relationships, the other, the other people that are involved in your life. And because we're not 
you know, carbon copies of one another. We're not all always going to agree on everything, but there's still uh, values that one person may have that they can still live out, even if the details are not exactly the same. So it's the fact that you're considering what other people want. That's already exhibiting a certain level of love, certain level of care, uh, mutual respect, and that feels good, being able to live those things out, even though there may be a compromise on the details of that expression. Yeah, and I think that's okay. I think it's okay to compromise and maybe do something that you don't love for someone that you do love, you know? And right. I'm sure there are things that you can find in it that, you know, you do, you know, certain aspects that you enjoy. <laughs> Well, if you choose not to do it that way, then it's just miserable right off, you know, the whole entire way. But yes, if you're able to flex your mind a little bit and find, you know, beauty in the ashes, then yes, it's going to be a little bit easier for you. Yeah, absolutely. So how did you come up with the framework um, that you talk about in your book? A lot of self-contemplation on how I guide people through their decision-making process. So it was just a lot of thinking and uh, kind of picking up patterns, themes that have worked for a lot of the people I've worked with. I don't know if you want the, the nerdy scientific answer. I, I can give you that one if you want in terms of what <laughs> the framework is based on, because it is based on science, but I don't know if how much details your audience <laughs> wants to hear. I don't know. Give it a go. Like, let's see what we can pick up. <laughs> Okay, cool. So high level, so the <laughs> high, high level, high level. I would say that uh, the the framework that's made up of four parts. Each part actually coincides with a theoretical orientation or a theory. So I'm not that smart. Like I just put the pieces together. These things already exist. So if we're going with feelings, that would be Dr. Ekman's work. Uh, he's kind of like the father of emotions. He's the one that got consulted for that Pixar movie, Inside Out. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but he, he's the guy that identified the core emotions that's universal. So humans have emotions, feelings, and there is a universal meaning behind what feelings mean. He's the guy that came up with it. So that's, that's where uh, identifying and understanding your emotions, that's that research from Paul Ekman. And then we talk about values. Values is a, I mean, that's not a psychology thing. There's a lot of uh, theology, uh, philosophy, right? That talks about values. But one train of thought is what we call ACT or acceptance commitment therapy. And they're really big about uh, defining values and what that looks like. So I, I got that piece of the framework from ACT. And then there's like a third part, which is values of others, understanding like what other people care about, which may not be the same thing as what you care about. And that would be uh, some of the, how do I say it? it it's, it's more of the couples therapy lens, like just kind of understanding that uh, the world doesn't revolve around you. And there's this thing called theory of mind, which is knowing that other people could have different thoughts than you. So it's, it's some of that research there. And then the last one is just reality factors, which is there's certain realities that exist regardless of how you feel and think about it. Things like gravity, like you don't have to understand gravity or know what it is, but you'll know gravity if you step off a cliff, right? You'll know it. So there, there's certain realities that exist in our world and we got to also... Uh, factor that into our decision making. And that's what we call uh, family systems therapy, talking about just our relationship, culture, society, that we don't live in a vacuum, that that sets the context to our decision making. And so those are kind of the four parts and I guess the origins of each of those parts. So um, when someone picks up this book and they read it, what do you want them to get from this book? If they don't take anything, if, if there's any, if there's any one thing that you want them to get, what is it? 
Only one thing. All right. Uh, let's think. <laughs> well, let's let's say one of the things is thinking about decision making as a skill, just like basketball skills, nunchuck skills, right? It, it's it's something that can be learned and something that can be perfected if you want to think of it that way. So some people they come up to me and they're like, I'm just indecisive or I can't make decisions or I make really bad decisions. Well, that's like saying, well, I, I suck at basketball, but I never pick up the ball and I, sh and I never shoot it, but I suck at it. It's like, well, yeah, of course you suck at it. You don't practice. You, you don't, you don't have a coach, right? You don't have anyone to help you get better. So you're going to keep sucking. It's the same with decision-making. Like you got to do it. Right. But I at least provide some sort of guardrails, some, some structure in thinking about how to make better decisions. So if you want the simple answer, follow the instructions, right? Follow the instructions, work through that process. And I'm going to take a guess that you're going to like where you land much more so than if you don't use a framework and you just kind of do it purely based on emotions or purely based on what other people think, like any sort of unbalanced way of coming to a conclusion, it's probably not your authentic self, right? It's not holistic enough. And then I guess the other takeaway is because it's a skill, don't give up, keep at it, keep practicing until you're at a certain level where you won't even need the framework because it's so ingrained in your mind at that point that you don't even need to follow steps one, two, three, or four. Right. So this this will help you with making all types of decisions, right? Like yeah. in, where you want to eat, not just the major decisions in life, right? That's so right. That's right. And in the small decisions, which I outlined in my book, you may not need every pillar or every stage of that framework. Maybe picking an ice cream flavor, you just need the first one, which is like, how do I feel? Definitely feeling strawberry cool feeling chocolate that's cool too like there's there's you don't need the rest of like what do i value about the ice cream like i don't know like that probably isn't super relevant so depending on the size of the question and how important it is not every piece of the framework would even be applicable but the big decisions absolutely i would recommend kind of working through that process yeah so earlier you said that you still have you know, trouble making some decisions. What are your biggest pain points with decision making? <laughs> My pain points are probably not being patient enough to gather more data points. It, it, it's like, all right, this is the information that's been handed to me. Let's just roll with it. And then when I do it, it's like, oh, that was a really big piece of information that I missed. And if I knew that, then I would totally not have done that or I would have done it differently. And, and, and that's just life. And I have to admit as much as we would like to plan our steps and, and you know, be in control, be on top of things. That's the funny thing about life is sometimes these really important data points don't show up until it's too late. <laughs> you already made a decision and then you learn like, oh, my bad. I'm like, right. I didn't know. And, and that, that happens. It, it totally happens. So I, I do want your audience to know that using the framework is not going to make you a hundred percent accurate. And, and you're just going to hit home runs every time, but it's definitely going to increase your probability of hitting home runs with your decision-making. Yeah. And some things, like you said, you can't control. Like if you decide to buy this new phone because it has all the features that you love, need, and want. And then three months later, the company announces a new phone that is the super phone to your phone. You wouldn't have known to like wait yeah. three, you know what I mean? So like, yeah, but making a decision on like, should I quit my job, you know, without having a job lined up, the framework will probably help you make the best decision. I was like, I don't even know if you need the framework for that one, <laughs> but, but yes, it, it's still worth considering the framework before right. you make any sort of important decision. Yes. Yeah. Some people definitely do would need the framework. <laughs>
they just need to slow down. You know, they just need to slow down, not run with their emotions. Think a little, right? Just kind of think through what is essential to your decision making. So that's so interesting that you said, um, don't listen to your emotions. Is that one of the biggest oh hell no's in decision making? <laughs> it's not I would, I would probably, yeah. <laughs> Is it an oh hell no? It, it's probably a oh hell no, don't just rely on your feelings to make a decision. That's usually what gets people into trouble. It's like it's only emotionally Field. And I'm saying, no, that's like one of four parts. Like you need to listen to your emotions and what it's trying to tell you, but that's only 25% of the equation. Like slow down, think about the other parts before you, you act upon it. Yeah, definitely. So um, do you feel like the work that you're doing is purpose-driven with um, doing your psychologist work? Um, are you still a practicing psychologist? I am. I I just saw a client right before we got on this call or, oh, or this meeting. Okay. Yeah. Do you still feel passionate about it and feel like you're still somehow fulfilling your purpose on this planet? Or do you think that there are other things that are waiting for you? Yes. And yes. So yes, I am. I am fulfilling my purpose doing the counseling work. I still believe in it and, and I love doing it. And yes. There, there is definitely a bigger platform that I think awaits. And this book definitely is one way of helping more people because I can't see everyone that may cross my path in my office. So I want to make some of these psychology tools accessible to, to the common person. And that's kind of my way of uh, reaching out in a broader way. Love it. So um, you have to share an oh hell no moment with us. Um, an oh hell no moment, of course, is the moment of shock or disbelief. Um, in that moment, you thought to yourself or you said out loud, oh hell no. Could have been something that, you know, changed your life completely or just something that taught you something that you take with you every day. So... Um. Not so many of those. Yeah, we have wait, wait, oh, wait. Hell no moments all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, let, let me share this one. So I would say this is one of my defining moments, and I definitely have a handful of those. One of my oh, hell no moments was when I was in high school. So this was, I think, junior year of high school, and I wanted to run for ASB, Associate Student Body. And I just remember running and being pit against like one of the most popular guys in school and it was just me and him so i was like oh hell no like why why am i pitted against this guy and i'm not really that popular so at that moment i was like i could have dropped out i could have been like you know what there's like no way that this is going to pan out but then there was that little voice in my head that's like well you never know, right? Like you never know how it's going to pan out. You should at least run a strong campaign. You got some friends, right? Like I, I think something's going to pan out. And what was really funny about that story is, you know, I campaigned, did whatever I needed to do. And they made it mandatory to give a speech. So I guess prior to that year, I don't know how people got elected, but no one needed to make speeches. They just kind of did whatever they did. So that individual, the popular kid, he was planning on doing backflips in the gymnasium, like just, just to like increase school spirit. I, I, that was like his strategy. But when the new ASB teacher was like, you have to stand behind a podium and give a speech. Oh, it like crushed him because he didn't prepare a speech. So that, that was the part that was like, oh, that was probably his oh hell no right. moment. <laughs> like, wait, that was wait, what? I, I can't, I can't do backflips. Like I have to, so his speech was, dare I say terrible because he, he didn't prepare, but I did because that's pretty much all I had was a speech and Cinderella story ended up winning that, that position. Wow. So look at you. So that taught you never to give up, huh? Just, just go for it. You just never know. Like at least in your clear conscience, you, you did the best that you could. And, and you didn't back down just because 
using the framework terms, right? The reality factors. I mean, that was true. He was clearly more popular, probably had way more friends, but it didn't mean that those other uh, factors didn't play a role in my decision-making. And in this case, it was the values. My, my values is, hey, I'm not a quitter, right? Like, I'm just going to play this thing out and, and do my best. And if I don't win, it wouldn't be a huge shocker because <laughs> I, I didn't really expect me to win anyways. But man, but if, what if I did though? That would be kind of crazy. So let's let's just go for it. Oh my God, that's such a good story. So, um, and you look so young. I can't even believe that you're like a doctor. <laughs> like, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> you really do. So tell everyone where they can find your book and how they can keep up with you and all the amazing things that you're doing. Sure. So my professional website is my name, www.timyen.com. And there's a link to my book, Choose Better, the Optimal Decision-Making Framework on there. You can also just try, type Choose Better on Amazon.com. And uh, I'm sure there's other booksellers, but that's probably the main one. Uh, and then I have a new Instagram called Choose Better Consulting, which uh, kind of highlights certain parts of the book, gives people some author insights into um, yeah, different parts of the book. And yeah, definitely want to invite your audience to contact me if they have any questions. Uh, collaborative opportunities. If, if they want coaching, whatever the case may be, uh, they can contact me through my website. Nice. All right. Thank you so much for coming through and sharing your wisdom with us. And we will be watching you to see what, you know, amazing things that you do. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Keisha. No problem.